Hey everyone, I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI, that's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, world's leading organization of residential commercial property inspectors. And um, right now, we're doing a live InterNACHI webinar. We do free online webinars um, once, twice, three times a week or so, and uh, they're all recorded. So if you wanted to register for a webinar, but you have a job scheduled, good for you. Um, you can watch it later. Uh, we'll send you a link to the video recording. And if you're watching it on YouTube right now, um, if you ever need anything from InterNACHI, just go to our homepage and scroll down to the contact uh, tab and uh, you can ask any question. Um, I'm available at any time. Uh, email is best. So today um, we're doing, we're usually doing a, a boring webinar where I teach, but sometimes we have exciting webinars where we have a special guest, like my friend uh, Britt. Britt Trees from North Carolina. Um, he's been an InterNACHI member for a long time, five, six years or so, um, and he's gonna talk about grading and moisture. And Britt's been um, uh, a CPI. He is a certified home inspector, um, has written um, more than 100 property uh, condition assessments. He's walked over six and a half million square feet of commercial property. Uh, documented over $31 million worth of immediate and capital reserve costs. He owns and operates WB Trees Consultants, a commercial property inspection firm located in Raleigh, North Carolina, as well as Five Senses Inspector Training. That's Five Senses Inspector Training, a big training school down in North Carolina. And Britt's also a member of the Certified Commercial Property Inspectors Association at ccpia.org. And uh, Britt, are you there? Can you hear me? There we go. Yes. There we go. Hey, buddy, thank you so much hey, for taking your busy schedule, a little bit of time out just to uh, spend some time with us in, on Internet Cheat and uh, talk about grading and moisture. I, I hear uh, this Friday your governor, um, Governor Roy, he's opening things up uh -oh. in your state. Is uh, that right? Yeah, that's what I've heard. Um, yeah, you know, we actually had waited to train a little bit, so we're going to get that started again. Uh, but we've been able to inspect somewhat. We're not too, too slow. And um, yeah, I mean, I hope that, yeah, I hope things feel more open. I hope I see people on the road again. Yeah, yeah. So Colorado, we're in Colorado, and things have opened up a little bit. And um, we'll see. As long as everyone stays safe and healthy, I think that's a good thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're going to talk about um, grading and moisture today. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, uh, you can take over okay. and start your slides whenever you awesome. want. All right, guys. Well, um, I have a great team of folks with me that have helped assemble this, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through some examples of things that we've seen uh, on site. In the last few years, and then just uh, there we go. Everybody should be able to see Perfect. that now. That's that looks great. Uh, good, uh, and just and then just at the end, try to extrapolate out some uh, some points and um, take some question and answer. Yeah. It, um, so while. Uh, Britt is presenting. If you have any questions, feel free to ask questions. There should be a little uh, question box somewhere around there on your screen if you are attending this live webinar. So sorry about that. All right. Great. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Internachi, for uh, for having us. Uh, one of my companies is called Five Senses Inspector Training. Uh, we are based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, my home inspection company is called Confident Home Inspection, and the commercial branch is called WB Trees Consultants. Um, I was at a waterfall recently. I thought that was a good, <laughs> a good uh, reminder as to why grading matters. <laughs> so we had already planned this, and uh, I saw a waterfall out at one of our, our state parks, something like that, or uh, my friend was fishing at a different waterfall, and I thought, that's a great image. So uh, we're going to think about that today. Um, just want to real quick at the top uh, say that you know this company and and uh, just having 
just having the various experience has been able to help us put this together. Um, my manager and, and assistant inspector, Jeff Burns, helped me write this and assemble it based on our previous inspections. And always want to thank uh, clients, first of all, friends, family, trainers, trainees, and teammates who have helped us and made this possible. And many of them are on some of these jobs with us, so they might recognize <laughs> some of these examples. Uh, so I don't need to go through all that. Um, before we kind of take some examples, I like to think for a minute about are we not only are we ready to learn, but do we still wonder about things we see in the world? I mean, I believe we're created to wonder. Um, sometimes it's helpful to get away from the city and the light pollution and actually see the stars in the sky. Um, maybe think about when the last time you stopped and took a look at a green inchworm or um, like my daughters play with a blue-tailed skink on our front porch. Um, some people might call it a hunger to learn or a growth mindset, but um, I believe it comes from something deeper and that's that we're made to, to wonder at things. So as we're looking at these pictures, as we're looking at home still in the field, um, it, it, I've noticed it helps me so much to still be so hungry to learn something and to wonder at why things are made the way they are. Um, let's look at our first home. Uh, this is one we did just a couple months ago. Uh, and, and you know, it's funny putting these pictures together. You kind of wonder if the, <laughs> the the picture taker is level when they take the picture or not. <laughs> that So you, this is all with the caveat. You've got to be on site when you do this kind of, obviously, when you do any of this work. But we're trying to, you know, take, take these pictures and learn some principles here. Uh, this home was built in 1946. It showed a lot of signs of deferred maintenance, which we're going to show. Uh, here in a few minutes. Um, but just as you pull up to the home, if it's downhill from the road, that's your first observation, right? You know this home, you're going to at least have moisture intrusion along the front wall here. Um, always try to orient it from the road, so that the front being uh, what faces the road here. And then there's possibly some negative grade um, along the left side as well and some standing water on the right in the back um, when it rains. So we'll see that as we go around the home. Uh, this is just a zoomed back picture of the same. So you can tell that it's, it's, a, a, bit, it's a bit downhill from the road. Um, again, that's your first observation when you're pulling up to a home. I always tell my guys, notice that as soon as we drive up, as we're parking, what's the grading like around the home? and then get out and start to investigate that. Uh, when it rains, the water is going to go downhill um, toward the front of that house. Um, we don't have a picture of one, but in our area, in North Carolina, a lot of times homes will be slightly downhill from the road, and they'll, they'll take sort of a long run. They'll have a big front yard, and there'll be a long run. They'll put a little bit of a swale in the front, but it won't really overcome the long run of, of rainwater that comes downhill. So, you know, in our experience, that's what we've seen is a, a lot of water on those front walls. Um, as you're walking around the property, you know, with regard to moisture intrusion, look at what the home is telling you. Um, we're kind of like, like home investigators or de detectives, I'll say. Uh, this home is showing, you know, signs of deferred maintenance. It's, it's got poor lighting on the, on the left side of the roof. So you've got this. Poor sun, you know, poor sunlight, there's overgrowth of trees, so you've got this mildew and growing up on the shingles. You've got some deferred maintenance on the trim. Uh, they're not keeping up with the property very well. So that's going to be part of the story as well. Um, next slide, you see the gutters are not only full of de debris, but sagging. Um, that's always a, a write-up for us, a defect. You know, in North Carolina, we have to DDID them, they say. We have to describe the, the component, the, describe the defect, give the implication, and direct for repair. Uh, so that's what we do on all of our write-ups for, for our homes that we inspect. When you go around to the back, this is a little bit harder on the aspect of the fixture taken, but the left photo is against the and underneath the back deck, there's a downspout that's pouring straight onto the ground there. 
Uh, you have a joint, a roof wall joint where it looks like it's hard to see. It looks like it's probably not flashed at all. Um, maybe they tried to get put some kick out in there, but it's come, it's uh, curling up. Where you're gonna, so you're gonna have moisture issues there. And then you can see just on the bottom right photo that they've had to put down some kind of cover either for, for weeds or for surface moisture. But e either way, you want to continue to notice that. When we get in the crawl space, you know, we wouldn't be surprised to find a, a sump pump, nor that it's already failed because it's a deferred maintenance home. <laughs> so you have all these things adding up now uh, by the time you get to the crawl space. Uh, there's a couple good reasons. I know people have different opinions on this that we tend to do crawl spaces last. The practical reason is it gets you real dirty. Uh, one of the other reasons is you've been able to observe everything else that you're doing uh, outside the home and inside and then go into the crawl space finally. Uh, from an energy standpoint, it's probably better to, <laughs> to crawl in there first because you're, <laughs> you're coming in hot. Uh, the next slide shows us just the falling insulation, which all of us have seen. You also can see a glimpse there of some surface mold growth on the joists. Another shot here of one of the foundation walls, likely, likely the front one, where you have the mold and the moisture growing up from the ground there. But again, the point is, we, we saw the beginnings of all this from the street. <laughs> And then, we, then we've gone around and been able to continue to observe and then verify those, those hypotheses we formed from the street. This next one is one of the more memorable homes, uh, I gotta say, I've ever done. It's about a story and a half below the street level. <laughs> uh, this one was built in 1995, we inspected it. Uh, it was quite a few years ago now. There's a there's a shot of this the home from the street. <laughs> so this would be more typical of something you might see out west. I know a lot of times in the Nazi videos, they're doing these these homes that are on some crazy grade. This isn't as common for us out here. Um, I will say this one's in this one's in a uh, particular a particular town that's that's known for being hilly and being overgrown and and uh, that was the case here. Uh, there's a shot. This is an older one, so it's not the best um, resolution of my old vehicle from the street. <laughs> so that's how far down it was. Uh, here's a shot of the negative grade. There's actually bas basically like an outside catwalk across from the stairs down, down from the road across into the front door. <laughs> And so we're going to expect to find moisture intrusion again at this front wall. Um, <laughs> apparently, Jeff, who has helped me out, thought this might remind Lord of the Rings fans of a certain bridge <laughs> where Gandalf fought a demon or something. I don't know. <laughs> I remember the bridge from the movie, but there you go. Uh, the grade, <laughs> the grade continued around to the left side of the home, there was uh, a deck and a balcony here. We're not even gonna go into the kinds of issues that deck and balcony may have had. Uh, we're just gonna focus on the intrusion in that front wall and into that basement area. But if you look at the topography of the area, um, the homes are the only, the, the only things that are even slightly on a level plane. Everything else is flowing downhill and to the right in this map. So when we get into the basement, uh, I find some of the most obvious termite damage I've ever seen on the interior of a home. It's net, it's gone. Uh, the termites have gone past that front wall and into the door frame along the front wall. Uh, this is that front right corner again. It's a little grainy because it's older. Um, and you got to be careful of those LED flashlights. Sometimes on the lower setting, they give you those lines. 
nevertheless, you can see that the moisture has now penetrated um, the drywall and it's getting on the carpet there. Two more shots from the basement was surface growth over the painted trim and growth up in the lower floor trim. Uh, we didn't pull that carpet because it wasn't, uh, we weren't inspecting for the owners, we were inspecting for the buyers on this one, but uh, there was surely mold behind that carpet as well. Third one we come to was listed for sale. It was built in 1957. It's a split level, which are really common around here. Um, it appeared to have been flipped. Uh, and so we wondered if it was one of those lipstick type flips. Uh, what sort of issues might have been a hidden or masked during this flipping process? That's just, it's just what the questions that we ask when we go out for clients. It looks really well kept up in the front, but as you go around to the back, you see uh, an interesting issue over there to the left. It's actually the right side of the home, but left in the picture that they have um, sort of scooped that out. And I can't recall right now off the top of my head if that was once a garage. I don't think it was, but it had some sort of awning there that was removed. It's now well below the grade on the main, the main part of the home. And when we got there, we just began to look at these sort of moisture travel paths around and through that retaining wall. It's hard to tell from that picture, but that retaining wall might've even been power washed. If, if they're power washing off moisture marks, guys, <laughs> you wanna ask why, what is going on with that home? Uh, Come to find out, it's hard to tell from, from some of these pictures, but it was actually that pad itself was slightly sloped back toward the back door. So anytime this client got a rain event, he had standing water over the carpet in his basement. Now again, the front, the front and the right sides of the home looked like they had a positive or flat grade, but it was so negative in the back and the water was running down and around that retaining wall that you had standing water like this inside the basement. So we thought this was an interesting comparison. You have the, uh, the listing photo that our client received and then the work that the client had to do after purchasing a home at any time it rained, you know, cutting out walls, removing carpet, removing tax strips, all that stuff. In the crawl space, you had a sump pump that had been pulled out, it was non-functioning. Um, at the same time, you want to notice here that a sump pump would not be able to keep up with the amount of water coming in there. And, and it should be viewed, in our opinion at least, as a last resort. Really what needed to be fixed on this home was the exterior drainage in the first place. Putting a sump pump in the crawl is a, is a Band-Aid fix. Uh, so just for this one, we thought it'd be good to think about the major items of this home. What would we tell the client they need to do first? First, they need to repair that grating. Uh, having water run around a retaining wall only to come back right through an open door threshold is not a solution. Um, they need to install something positive uh, to run that water, all of that surface water away from the home. And then, if that's not working or if it, there needs to be something secondary, then that would be exterior drainage before we allow the water to run into the, an inhabited area of their home. Then as a last resort, you would install or repair the interior drainage. Then on this one, would it be good? I've got a couple more of these. Would it be good to maybe just stop? I often will stop and take questions just as they're popping up. If there's anybody asking anything, it might be a good time to do that. This is fantastic. Um, I would keep on going. Uh, we don't have any live questions being asked right now. So um, I think everyone's just engaged. I love it. 
Oh, here's a question. Michael asks, when you have a residence that appears to be I near- I can read this one. I can't hear you, but I can read oh. this one. They're like- Oh, sorry, I had my whole microphone yep. off. Yep, yep. Um, we've got one question, one. and I, I'm, I think everyone's just engaged with the, the pictures there. Yeah. It's a really okay. great presentation. Great. But Michael asks, when you have a residence that appears to be never, uh, near level or slightly negative grade, how do you write it uh, in your report as a potential defect when it's borderline and hard to tell? That's really good. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of training in class, and I know this is hard, so I'm just kind of saying it's hard to answer this in, in just one example, but we do a lot of talking about have your form in mind that you're going to report your defects in almost like a template that you do your defects in. So I just went through DDID a little bit. But if you've done, you know, sometimes we think about if you do 40 or 50 or 70 defects on a home and you've done 100 of them, now you're, you've written, you know, 7,000 of those defects by the time you do 70 over 100 homes. That's a lot. So you want to have a process that you go through. So ours, is, again, your template might be different, but ours is DDID for North Carolina. So I would say something like um, uh, flat to negative grade is visible on the right side of the home, period. I'm always, I'm always saying the, the punctuation because I often dictate on site uh, using my, my home inspection software. Uh, and I can type this out as well, but you know, flat or negative grade is, or flat to negative grade is visible on the right side of the home, period. This leads to moisture intrusion, and I might add it, and sometimes pest infestation. In our area, we've seen a lot of sitting water that leads to like mosquito beds and stuff, and these little ponding on the right side of the home, I'm just, in my mind as I'm just picturing this. And then, you know, you'd say uh, re repair to positive grade, you could say monitor for repairs. Uh, you could say monitor for damage and repair as needed. Some kind of re repair recommendation there, I think, is in order. But, you know, we talk about a lot of times when you're starting out, you feel like you have to connect it to all these other things. And you feel like you have to um, pull a whole bunch of data in. But the thing is, on site, you're the professional. <laughs> Your observation, if, if, there, if there's something that you don't like about it, it's probably a defect. So trust yourself. If you see that on, on site, write it up. And you've, that, that's your standard is what you see on site and, the, and you're going to report on everything, then write that up. Um, I think you're always more protected to write a little bit more than a little bit less. Ben, what would you say on that? Yeah, and what's that DDID again? It is, and I'm summarizing here. I'm not reading it off of the standard, but it's in the North Carolina uh, Home Inspector Licensure Board Standards. My guys are probably banging their heads against the wall as they hear this. <laughs> They've heard this so many times. There is a required way to report on defects. And that is to, the first D is to describe the component. So here you're talking about grading. Um, I teach my guys to always put a location in description and not rely on their photos only because often you know that your summary is going to get copied and sent around and it may or may not, probably doesn't have the pictures. So don't rely on the pictures to describe. Describe it in words. We orient everything from the front door. Not We don't use cardinal directions for, for residential. We just do the front door because that's homeowner level understanding, right? Front, right, corner, or something like that. Then we, so make that a complete sentence. It's, <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine that like home inspectors think they don't have to write in complete sentences. I used to teach English. <laughs> I'm taught in college. Don't write in incomplete sentences, right? Write fully complete sentences that have verbs, subjects and verbs. and predicates and use proper punctuation because it, it makes you look professional quite honestly it's more readable um, the second sentence is the defect sometimes that can be just combined in the first sentence so whatever the defect is again right side of the home shows flat to negative grading that just is the defect the defect itself the next section is the implication so you're going to essentially show the connection between the defect that's visible or observable and to what uh, will or will will given time happen. If it's a safety hazard right now, we just say this is a safety hazard. Um, Non-operable items like a door or a window, it, it's kind of hard to come up with an implication. We just often say repair to, op to proper operation. But then the final section is the repair. 
but in North Carolina, it's like, it's like direction for repair. So it's describe the component, describe the defect, state the implication, and direct the client to a course of repair. Thank you. So that was a long, <laughs> that was a long explanation for one question, but I think there's a lot of theory that goes into how you write your, your, um, your comments and yep. they speak to what kind of inspector you are. Um, cool. We'll keep those coming. I'll, I'll keep the Q and A up. I didn't even see that. So thank you then. Yeah. Um, this, you know, is a bit different and is, is different. I think from all the, the other ones that we're going to see, this was a upscale renovated apartment building in downtown. Um, but if you were to look at the questions inside, you would think, uh, it's, it's pretty modern, pretty new though. Um, when you look at the, some of the listing pictures, they've got a lock box there by the door. They've installed these really sleek, uh, fixed windows and, and metal doors there for their entrances. They had mailboxes in the foyer, all this kind of stuff. But if you look closely, even at this first picture, there's a whole floor that's fully below grade on this building. It's down here on the right side and there appear to be wells around it, which we'll get to actually how those were installed. But this was an old mill or an old factory. And as we look at the next picture, we're going to, you know, think for a minute about how some of its prior use and, and prior construction uh, choices would affect its current use as a residential building. One of them that comes quickly to mind is there's no eave on, our, on this roof here. There's a flat roof. <laughs> so any other rain that's coming down all the way from the parapet wall and the coping at the top is going to either flow down the wall or be blown directly into basically where those walls are into those basement apartments, exterior walls. So that's, and even if it had an eave all the way up at the second floor, probably wouldn't do much, but it's just an observation that you're making while you're outside. The second thing is on these older buildings, you're not going to inspect expect to have a moisture barrier in those walls. Um, often in the plans and the buildings we've looked at, those older buildings did not have a, any kind of vapor blocking, you know, six mil poly type of, uh, or even semi-permeable barrier in the wall cavity. So we're just gonna expect, expect water to just wick and wick right through the brick and also flow through any openings as it's pooling uh, outside of these basement apartments. The grading, this is from a different side of the building, but you can see it's similar throughout. You have, um, that area is barely escapable, but it's not really draining the water in here. Um, so the next shot you have is a lot, of, and there's a lot of data here, but when you look down into the wells, there's actually no drain outs for them. And, you know, at first glance, you might say, oh, that looks pretty dry. But if you look at some of the joints around those wells, you're starting to see organic growth in the wells. Uh, so this, um, this client had been reporting to us uh, that she had um, headaches, she had, uh, this, was a, this was a mold job, this is a mold test. Um, she had headaches, she had um, uh, gut and digestive issues, and she had what she called brain fog and um, wanted to know what it was coming from and suspected that it was mold. Um, we do mold jobs because we find that they directly help clients immediately and clients really appreciate them. Um, and you know, if, if you think you're in a building business, but not a people business, uh, you want to rethink that. Um, I want to be motivated in what we do by helping specific human beings that are around us. Um, and so this job was memorable for that fact because uh, she was able to get out of the apartment and get some help. Uh, this is a shot that a different tenant took that we just located, but we thought it was interesting uh, from an interior perspective that you can see moisture marks coming down the wall. Um, when we pulled back this client's carpet, we were finding uh, damaged and, and deteriorated tack strips. You can see the, the black one, or the one on the right there almost isn't visible because it's so dark. 
uh, you can see efflorescence and moisture coming through those walls. Uh, another angle or another corner of the carpet showed, again, discolored tack strips and the pad. I mean, the pad is a big sponge. You know, while, while we put pads on basement floors, I just, I'll never know. Um, the smartest thing I've seen a client do is just put an area rug if you want a rug, but don't put a pad under it and make it permanent, then you can't see it. Um, because there's lots of reasons that those cement pads get, get wet. But with, with this client, what we ended up doing, um, was trying to give her um, a kind of a way to move forward. So this is this comes straight from the report. Um, we have our own sort of mold template that we use to try to help clients in these types of situations. Uh, we said again, you know, she wasn't gonna be able, she didn't own this building, but if she's delivering this to the owner, the number one thing for her apartment was what's already happening outside before she moves in. The drainage and that exterior wall. Uh, we did some, you know, we did some testing. This is, this is, a, this touches into, you know, indoor air quality stuff, but, um, we tested this and found, we used a certified lab here locally. We tested and found these strands of, of mold, um, in the air in the basement. So that way she's able to also take that to her doctor in this case, uh, again, just trying to be client focused. We also found a different type of a mold strand in the HVAC system, which wasn't pictured, but we also tape sampled that. Um, this is the language again from the report. We care about her help, her you know health. Uh, first thing, ask somebody to take another look at that drainage and that exterior wall and try to find some positive way to to shed or remove the water before it's coming into that space. It's just hard to handle an interior space that amount of moisture just like we saw with the, that big house down the hill once that water is coming down that front hill it's, it's very difficult to come up with a solution uh other than just running five dehumidifiers all the time but you're still going to get damage to your exteriors uh in those cases so uh, and i'm not I'm not a drainage or an exterior wall expert in that sense but uh, they needed to do something about that for their for their basement uh, clients, we you know we directed her to remove and replace the carpet pad and tack strips. Although now having just gone over this again, I don't know if I'd recommend the carpet be replaced at all. You know, find something else to do there. Um, so it's good to keep learning. <laughs> um, remove the mold growth in the HVAC. Uh, for the short term, install a dehumidifier. And uh, we recommended that she continue to get the air tested after these fixes took place so she can verify. Uh, we do have that, a question. That happened. You want to do the, you want to do another question? Yeah. Uh, Colton asks if there is a negative, oops, I do that all the time. <laughs> I do that all the time. Colton yeah, asks yeah. if there's a negative grade on the property, but it terminates before mm -hmm. the home and levels out, what's a good rule of thumb of, how far away the negative grade ends before it causes issues, or is it more of a case by case basis? Well, uh, before you answer, like yeah. the code says, like you should have slope mm -hmm. all around the house, not even yes. flat. Yes. So if there is a if there's a sloping uh, grade yeah. coming towards the house and it levels mm -hmm. off, that's no good. Like right. the first ten feet surrounding the house should drop about six inches. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why flat flat grading is is just not positive so it's a defect um i think the other thing that i'll look at is even if it does have a positive grade coming away from the home if the negative grade is is steeper and or longer and you're finding evidence of intrusion again often on the front wall i'm definitely writing it up we we'll just say that the, the swell is insufficient or the drainage is insufficient and you know it's helpful to know how to do a, a buried french drain uh, but i don't know that you know, you always have to know that, but if you have some experience in those fields and you can explain that to a client, that's always really helpful on site. The other thing um, um, we always did was we kept our mouth shut. <laughs> so if you're on the outside of the house, 
you know, yeah. and you, you see some negative drainage, um, <laughs> it'll start jumping up and down quite yet. You know, I like, yeah. I like that full uh, perspective inside and out. Yeah. Um, so if there's negative drainage or something on the outside, I'd love to connect things together to get the full picture. So yep. wait until you're inside and see what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it makes sense too. Yeah. If you're, if you're just giving the client every defect immediately, you're also really going to worry them. Yep. Uh, this one we did an inspection on. It's also uh, a friend's house. So thanks to him for the pictures. Um, you know, again, pulling up to it, you don't think that that's a negative grade, but once they raise those, those, those garden beds there and push some of that dirt probably within, certainly within 10 feet of that front wall, you're creating a flat to a negative grade along the front wall. Um, and he has an almost fully below grade, um, basement, which we'll see in a second. But this is a this is a typical sort of Piedmont home uh, in our state. Uh, it's a '70s rancher, um, fairly common. You can see that it does become negative toward this front left corner, and it turns away to be in positive along the left side. But just that flow and that action of the moisture coming toward that corner is going to is going to create some issues, which we then verified upon being in the basement. Uh, this is a closer view of that left wall. They've um, everything slopes to the backyard. It's it's slightly positive here, but you also can see the moisture marks and some of the dirt from the, the probably the rain splatter and things uh, along that wall. When you get inside, we'll we'll find more uh, that's worth looking at in that in that basement. They've tried, kind of tried to cover up those windows. I don't recall if there are those, um, those vents. I don't recall if that worked or not. Uh, there's pretty much efflorescence on the, the cement block throughout. There's also a long horizontal crack, which is a bit unusual for us. Uh, typically, you see pretty thin vertical cracks, but horizontal cracks are, um, are much less common. This left picture is uh, is where the supply line comes in to the well tank. And it's also at that front left corner of the basement. You see step cracking, you see uh, water coming in around that penetration and also likely just flowing through the mortar joints there. Um, it's kind of making a I don't know, almost like a tent and a tank sort of mark there all, all along the wall. The top right picture is another just random point along that left wall uh, <laughs> that water is just finding its way through. And the bottom picture is a clean out that's going through the wall. And you also have water just finding its way through various joints. I believe that's actually at the rear wall of the home uh, a lot of mixed plumbing but that's a different topic he had i think he had cast iron abs and pvc <laughs> all on, you know all visible in the in the basement um jeff noted this on this property he said you know when you build a, a basement and certainly one that's uh fully below grade he said he heard a builder you know tell him that imagine you're building a pool instead of putting water in it, you were trying to keep it out. How, you know, how would you manage that? Uh, essentially, there's, the, there's that hydrostatic pressure over years and years and years now, you know, probably 50, 45, 50 years ever since it was built, of pushing against that front wall. Samuel asks, do you recommend a foundation uh, specialist for this basement? <laughs> Um, that'd be uh, funny. We should, ask, we should ask the owner. <laughs> just, just paint over. Um, he's a, he's a, he's an inspector now. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, see what he thinks. Um, that was a long horizontal crack. And I think I was doing this uh, once he already owned the property. I think, yeah, that long, the length of that horizontal crack and the fact that the owner had already put in bracing, which we didn't picture, 
there were some other factors. Again, I'm trying to put back together the story for you guys. There were some other things going on that I probably would have, but I think at the end of the day, he wouldn't have recommended anything because it hadn't moved very much, but it wasn't very long. Horizontal crack, it just wasn't very wide. Um, it ran half the length or half the width of that wall, but uh, it hadn't really opened up a lot. I think to be safe, I probably would. Um, but I don't think at the end of the day that that engineer would have done a whole lot with it. Well, Brad asks, um, how do you make that decision to call for an engineer or a contractor or a continued monitoring when you provide your direction for the client? How do you how do you make those decisions? Like when something is just uh, let's wait and see, you just keep an eye on yeah. it, or all yeah. the way to the other extreme, uh, a structural engineer is recommended. I mean, I think we kind of just gave it a little bit there. You know, there's a thought process to what else is going on around the home. Um, how big is the movement? How recent is the movement? I'm, I'm thinking back through, honestly, some of the Nazi stuff that I've trained and, ta and taught as well. But, um, you know, structural engineers are a safeguard for us recommending them, but also they're pretty expensive and maybe not of a super high utility for clients. I understand there's a, there's a, um, there's a protection aspect of it for us. Uh, a foundation contractor would be like, if I thought there was an immediate repair and then continued monitoring would be like, if it's small and I just want the client to know about it, but I don't really think there's any repair to be done. Yeah. You know, here, if there was, again, the recommendations are going to be starting on the outside again with the grading. If those things were done, do, do we expect this wall to move a whole lot more over time? Probably a little bit, but not nearly as much as it's likely to if we continue to let water just build up and run toward those walls. So thanks, Brad. Sorry, I caught the, the, last, the first two guys. Uh, if we have... Maybe just one more, and then we'll have some time for, for questions. Sure. Um, this is a little downtown apartment building. This had been a while ago, and um, we didn't catch the interior pictures as much on this one either. But the client, again, had a mold issue, had small children in the home. Uh, lo and behold, he had a basement apartment. And when we, <laughs> when we researched uh, the floodplain maps, not only was he on the basement, On the slab, he was very close to a pretty high moisture area. This is a this is a floodplain map. So it's just a side note, but you want to know where your floodplain maps are for your area. Uh, and if you have concerns, you can also verify that those concerns using the maps. I mean, not in every home would you necessarily need to do that, but it's good to know where that that research is available to you. Um, we found, and we this is what we wrote to the client. Evidence of prior moisture damage to the property. It resides adjacent to a floodplain. And then we wrote up the types of mold form that we found in our testing. Um, but again, the point here is it's not surprising that this gentleman and his family had mold issues because of the, the grading and the water outside. Um, here's a few things just to kind of take home with you. Um, it's good to, you know, and I've heard this on a lot of trainings from a lot of different sources, but to observe from a distance, to observe the roof from a distance, to observe the grading from, from a distance, the driveway, on which side of the home is the dark side. Um, look at the typical places that you look for moisture. So really, it's funny right, putting all this together. Nothing in, in, nothing in a single point was unexpected, right? I mean, that these were all typical defects that we could almost predict, but once you're on site, you're trying to put it together, like Ben said. Uh, look at the joints and penetrations. Look at uh, look how the roof and the gutters and the downspouts relate to the moisture flow around the home. Um, talk to the occupants, whether you're, it doesn't matter who you're working for, you can always ask them questions if somebody's on site, whether you're working for a renter, an owner, or a buyer, you can talk to these these folks and ask them where what are the issues that they have seen 
I'll often say when somebody specifically having a mold concern, I'll say, which is the room in the house that you like to be in the least? Which room do you hate to be in? Because their senses, I didn't say this at the top, but one of their five senses is their sense of smell and their, their sense of where a damp space is. And they will tell you without a doubt which room it is. Even if they don't know why, they know why they don't want to be in there. They know that they don't want to be in there. So talk to those occupants. Note the interconnections of these systems. Pay close attention to the foundation and how the water is relating to the foundation. Continue to ask more questions and use not only your site, um, listen for sounds, touch a lot of stuff. I put my hands on a lot of walls and, and, and ground when we're, when we're concerned with these things you know, poking into an area that looks soft. Um, I guess I say, always say use all five. I don't really taste stuff, but you can, <laughs> but you can, it's part, it's close to smell though. I mean, you can feel uh, spaces that are, that are overly moist. Um, I'll do both of those in just a second. Let me, let me finish these. Um, and then finally, just to review some of the connections we saw. Saw connections with the roof. Um, also, the gutters and downspouts should be considered in there. Certainly, the visible grading. Um, the there are floodplain issues. Is there already installed um, exterior drainage, interior drainage? Do you see visible moisture on the walls and floors? Uh, we even saw some on the trim on one of those examples. Uh, What I'll just I'll just read these or do you want to read them? Yeah, uh, for people watching it later, um, uh, please read the question. Can't hear you yet. So what we want to do is uh, yeah, um, read the question out loud because the video oh, later uh, people will be watching it later and they won't be Got able it. to see the questions. So if gotcha. you read them, okay. that'd be great. Thank you. Yep. What reporting software do you use or recommend for mold inspections? We've used a few different things over the years. Currently, we use Tap Inspect. Uh, it is very uh, adaptable for our purposes for different types of inspections. I have um, have students who love and uh, say that this that one software gets them a whole lot more business than that Spectora. Um, I just like something that I know how to use and I feel like is adaptable and can be delivered quickly is really what I'm looking for. I want the client to be able to read it um, and understand what they're looking at. Certain softwares, I think, again, coming from an English background, I think are actually pretty hard to read when they, when they print out or they develop or they um, produce to the client side. So I just want it to be clean is really what I'm looking for. Clean and quick. Uh, but I like TAP, and again, a lot of my guys like Spectora. Uh, <laughs> I, that's that's a good comment, I guess. I, I, um, I don't know if I need to read that one. I, yeah, we could have scrubbed that, but I feel like you know that that's something that's publicly available. That map, so yeah, no, no intention to. To anybody on that yes, <laughs> sharing that map. Yeah. yeah, Jeremy just saw something <laughs> like it was it wasn't really confidential information on the right, right, map. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um thank you guys. I mean I hope that's helpful and I think I, I wanted to encourage everybody watching with this, you know, like as you go out and inspect and you wonder and you ask questions and you learn, you know, you're building not only your experience base, but you're helping your clients. Um, we just think this is one really important uh, thing that sometimes gets overlooked. And sometimes clients are like, I don't understand why I'm having these issues. And it's, it's actually very predictable that that split level, for instance, will continue to be a pool downstairs every time it rains until they fix the outside issues. Um, so, you know, we think as you're getting out there and you have this in mind, you're going to grow more and you're going to learn more and become a better inspector. Yep. Well, my friend, Thank you so much yes, sir. for spending time with us. Um, I think you're right. We're, we're built to wander and, and uh, you, <laughs> you had some really great pictures and I was just totally engaged. I got a, I got a better my training, man. You're really good. So uh, 
thank you so much for taking some time and, and teaching us about um, some really important topics today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Stay safe and healthy. All right. You too. See you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you, Brett. Bye.